want to welcome you here today. We're glad that you can come out. This is a special edition of the Bible class where we're going to have Shannon Hurley, who is a missionary in Uganda with SOS Ministries or Sufficiency of Scripture Ministries there. And uh, you'll be hearing from him in a few minutes. He's over doing the announcements in the main service right now. We're being introduced during the announcements. And so you're going to have to put up with me for a few minutes. Uh, but Shannon and his family have been there, I think, uh, 17 years in Uganda, and they are doing a remarkable work there. They're actually having an influence over that whole country uh, of Uganda, and it's a really a wide open field, and they are making the most of it. When I first went there in uh, 2009, uh, on, their, on their property, all that was there was their house. And in a minute, I'm, we're going to show you a video, and you'll see what their campus looks like now. And it's a lot more than just a house there now. They have an elementary school with 600 children in it. Uh, they have a medical center. Uh, they have six missionary houses now. Uh, they have housing for the teachers for the elementary school. Uh, they have uh, uh, a, a church right now that can seat 500 that isn't big enough. So they're building a, a thousand seat auditorium that we sent them money to help them to do that as part of our double double uh, program. And uh, they have a school they're starting. They do conferences all around the country. And that's what I did the two times I went. I spoke at pastors conferences. And now they've kind of bringing in the best of the best to a uh, shepherd's training center that they have on campus there. So they have a building for that and, and housing for when the guys come and they bring their families with them and so it's uh it, it's phenomenal to think what has happened just since i went there in 2009 what's that 14 years ago uh and, and all around the house when i went there was nothing but jungle in fact that when i went there the first time we were leaving to go to the conference in another part of the country and they had two vehicles and we're taking both vehicles to take everything we need to the conference so uh, Shannon's wife and kids are going to be at, at home with no vehicles. And so they had to make sure they had anti-venom on hand uh, just in case, you know. I, I was thinking I never left home wondering if we had anti-venom around, you know. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a different kind of a situation, but uh, the Lord has really blessed that. So let's go ahead and see the video. And this this video is maybe a year or so old, but it'll give you a good picture of the whole uh, the whole campus there and all that they're doing. SOS Ministries, located deep in a village of Uganda, Africa, is a ministry that seeks to make a difference that will last for generations. SOS is motivated out of key values, such as the supremacy of Christ, dependency on Christ, passion for the local church, discipleship, and love of people. SOS works with a national leadership team to accomplish its mission of impacting its community for Christ and strengthening churches throughout all of East Africa. Since moving to Uganda in 2006, God has faithfully brought Shannon and Danielle Hurley through many hurdles and heartaches to see this organization grow from a distant dream to a reality. In their efforts to accomplish their first goal of discipling their community, with their team of Ugandan leaders and key missionary families, they established a church of 300 nationals and a high-quality primary school in an impoverished community. And in an effort to achieve their second goal of solidifying God's church in Uganda, SOS is strengthening 1,500 Baptist churches through conferences, leadership trainings, church visitations, and strategic planning, and is now launching Shepherd's Training Center to fully equip the future pastors of Uganda, which sets the stage for a revolutionizing church planting movement throughout East Africa. We believe that God, right now, is writing the history of His church in East Africa. And we invite you to participate with us in making it happen. Yeah. 
Yeah, so when they mentioned the Baptist Union that they work with, there are 1,500 uh, Baptist churches throughout Uganda, and Shannon is providing the training for all of them. And so that's how they're impacting a whole, a whole country. Uh, and, and so it is amazing. And so I've had the opportunity to go there a couple of times. Uh, my son Ben has been there a couple of times. Once just recently, a few weeks ago, he, w he was over there. And, uh, and if you were at the service last night, you all got an invitation to go there, didn't you? And you're all ready to go, right? <laughs> you might want to count the cost before you say, yeah, I, I want to I do that. So we're trying to get uh, Bobby and Bill to go there as well. Don't you think that we should have Scripture of the Day, Uganda edition? <laughs> Be sure you tell them that when you see them. When are we going to have Scripture of the Day Uganda? Don't tell them I, I told you to say that. But uh, I think that would be a good thing uh, to do. Uh, so like I said, uh, it's been interesting how this, has, how, how this has worked out. I'll tell you a little bit of the story. Somebody called me up in March of 2009 and said, Hey, Shannon and Danielle Hurley are going to be in San Antonio. Uh, you should meet them and go out to dinner with them. And I knew who he was, uh, and, and I knew you know, Ben had already been there. And so Roberta and I met them for dinner, and they're telling us their story about Uganda and everything that the Lord's doing there, and we're going, that sounds great, praise the Lord. And then he says, yeah, and we have a conference set up for two months from now, and the speaker just let me know he can't make it. We want you to come. <laughs> and uh, I was going from dinner to, the, to an elders meeting, and so I said, well, I don't, I know, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll have to run it by the elders. You know, I, they'd have to give the okay. And so I went to the elders meeting, and they let me down big time and said, oh, yeah, you're going. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did go. I had to get seven shots just to go there. Um, but I'm glad I did, and we, we did a pastor's conference. And, uh, you, you know, it was in this, it was in kind of an interesting area. It was being held at a school, uh, a girls' school, boarding school, uh, that was off for that time. Um, but if that school, and, and everybody there was saying, wow, this is a great facility. How did you guys get this? This is awesome. And, but if that school was anywhere in America, it would be condemned. Uh, it was, it was not good. Uh, and so, and, and, to, and to clean yourself each day you got a bucket of water, and you, you did whatever you could do uh, to clean up each day. So I'm drinking nothing but bottled water. I'm brushing my teeth with bottled water. I took beef jerky with me. That's what I'm eating. The only thing I had there that on that first trip was tea because I knew the water had been boiled. Um, and I somehow, I somehow survived uh, all that. But I didn't want to shave either because I didn't want the water. You know, I didn't know what's in the water getting under my skin. And uh, Shannon had told me that there's a hotel right near the airport. When I take you to the airport, uh, we'll stop there. You can rent a room for an hour. You can get cleaned up and get ready for your trip home. And I'm, I'm thinking, great. Um, but as the week went on, I'm realizing we're a long ways away from the airport. And I'm starting to figure out Ugandan time, which is not necessarily on time. Uh, and so that, that trip, that that stop at the hotel started to make a lot more, become much more important to me. And so the night before we were all done, I asked Shannon, how much does it cost to put on one of these conferences? You know, there were 200 men there, plus a lot of their wives came, and they bussed them all in, they housed them at the school, they fed them three meals a day, every day. I said, how much does, did this cost? And he said, $8,000 at that time, and I, I was thinking, that's the best deal I've ever heard of. A conference for 200 pastors for $8,000? You couldn't, you couldn't do anything like that around here. And so I, I said to him, and so this, is, this will show you how missions works. I said to him, you get me to that hotel for my shower before, the, before my plane leaves, our church will send you $8,000. <laughs> and they've been sending it to him ever since. Um, so that's, that's how it works. And it's been a great association. It's been great to follow uh, what they've done. Our church sent a group of people, about a dozen people, over there on a short-term one-week trip at one time. And it, I think it was pretty life-changing for all of them to go. 
And so if you have opportunities to do things like that, you should, because you can hear somebody like me talk about it. You can watch a video about it. Uh, but uh, if you go there, you'll really get the feel for it and, and uh, to see what the Lord is doing. And it's nice. It's encouraging, too. We're, you know, we're, we're thinking about what the Lord is doing here in Huntington Beach, um, but, but he's doing things all around the world. And it's nice to be able to go and to, and to see that and, and to see uh, the opportunity. I mean, we're trying to reach a city. Uh, over there, they're reaching a whole country. And, and so it's amazing what the Lord has done. And, and, uh, and, and Shannon is, is here with us in the room now. So uh, that's enough of me. Uh, let, let me pray, and we'll have Shannon come on up here. Lord, we do thank you for the work that you're doing. You're, you're a God who is, is saving people and building your church all around the world. And it is encouraging for us to see what you're doing in another part of the world, a part of the world we probably rarely even think about, but yet a place where you're powerfully working and your glory is being put on display. And so, Father, we're thankful for Shannon. We're thankful for the work that you're doing in and through him and his family and all the co-workers that he has there with him. And, uh, Lord, we are uh, just thankful for this opportunity that we have to partner with them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Shannon, come on. Come on up. <laughs> you know that thing about Ugandan time? <laughs> We're, we end this class on time. <laughs> what time is that? Okay, cool. Thanks. He said 1020, which probably means translated because he knows me. <laughs> well, what a joy it is to be with all of you. Uh, can we say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Let me say, boy, which means praise the Lord. And you're supposed to say, Amina. Amina. boy. Now we need to get you to do it with a little flair. Amina. All right. Makama yebazibwe. Amina. You can get that arm going. Come on. Here we go. Let's go. Uh, well, praise the Lord. What a joy it is to be here at Compass Bible Church. And what a joy it is to be with uh, my friend and, and dear brother, uh, Bruce uh, Blakey. What a, it's just awesome. It's awesome to be part of God's family, isn't it? And to be able to engage in kingdom ministry all around the world. And uh, even the Petruses, who uh, I've known since Josh was a little kid. And uh, not quite little there. He was always extra big. Uh, but uh, I used to do a, a youth camp when he was in a youth group. And, and I preached there. And, uh, and have gotten to see and cheerlead Josh on through the years. And even Ben Blakey, when he was still in college, went there. It just means I'm getting older, I think, because these guys are getting uh, men, and I'm, I'm still around. I think I'm still young, though, right, Josh? Come on, tell me about it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, well, what a joy it is. You know, this is an opportunity to tell everybody not about me, but about what God is doing in the world. And I do want to give my testimony, but it is a story of God. I love Ephesians 2.10 because it says that for we are his, what? Workmanship, Workmanship created in for which he prepared in advance that we would walk in. I never planned on being a missionary. Never planned on it. Never even, like, didn't read biographies. I actually grew up in really an unchristian home that went to church. And uh, maybe before I go into all of it, here is my family right here. Uh, so there is my wife. That's not my daughter. That's my wife. Uh, and, uh, and there are my kids. I have two kids missing from, actually, I've got, yeah, two kids missing from that picture right there. And uh, so we have, you know, we have eight children. Three are biological. Five are adopted legally, so we call those our legal children. Then we have another seven kids that live with us all year round. We call those our foster kids. Then we have another 35 kids that actually call us mom and dad that go to boarding school. When they're done with boarding school, they'll live with us from months to months. So our home is full and very active. And, uh, and part of that, and, and I'll explain in a little while, is children are abandoned everywhere in Uganda. 
And we get the joy and privilege of loving them and doing what we can to help them know Christ and follow after him. And so my kids might come in later on. If, if they do, I'll introduce them. I love, just before we get going, because I'll forget, take out your phones, if you don't mind. Come to our website through that QR code. And at the bottom of the website, there's a place to put your email in. I would love for all of you to put your email in, and I want to encourage you in the Lord. I want to use that to share what God is doing in Uganda, encourage you in the Lord. And uh, you can go, there's, if you go our Vimeo at the bottom, you can see all kinds of videos. There's sermons there, all kinds of things that can encourage you in Christ. But we want to love the Lord together. And uh, I would love for you guys to do that and send out, get others on that email list just so that we can uh, get the message of what God's doing in Uganda out there. Let me come and share a little bit of my story of God's grace. And God, in his kindness, uh, allowed me to grow up in a home with two parents, and there were five boys in our home. I was born in Covina, California. At two years old, we moved to a place in um, Upland, California. And someone, by God's kindness, went door to door and invited my parents to church. Don't underestimate door to, to door. And someone, and actually when the story comes that they actually came and said, ah, let's be done for the day. And then they said, let's do one more door. And uh, that one more door was my parents' house. And so, and I just was with her because uh, I preached in their church last week. And uh, she's still alive that went door to door. But praise God for that ministry. And uh, the impact that we can have when we just have a little boldness and invite people to church. So my parents came to church. We went to a good Bible church when I was a kid. So I was a part of a Awana. Uh, I was a spark and a pioneer. Come on, anybody else? Come on. I wanted the, as many jewels as I can get. And uh, that had a strong impact. My youth pastor, uh, who was my youth pastor in junior high, taught me to have a quiet time. But my parents left that church and went to a feel-good Baptist church. Anybody know, know those, what I'm talking about? Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, but uh, I went there, but as a kid, and when I got into junior high, I started realizing there were girls and things like that, and my brain started getting impacted negatively. Part of it is I looked at a bad magazine. And uh, back then, thank God it was in that form, I looked at some bad magazine, it affected my mind. And just for one month, I'm like looking at this magazine, and I realized right then, I, this is not what I want. And uh, from a young age, even when I was five years old, I'd, I'd go to kindergarten and pass out tracts at school. So God was at work in my heart, was at work in my life. And uh, when I had that junior high school, I'm like, this is not what I want. I got rid of the magazine. I tell people I threw it over the fence, and my neighbor became perverted. But... Uh, <laughs> Anything I needed to do just by the Spirit of God at work in my life, I was like, I need to follow Christ. So I surrender my life to Christ at 12 years old, and I'm like, well, i got to read my Bible. Where should I read? And I'm like, everybody reads the Psalms. So I opened up the Psalm 1, and it said that I could be a tree planted by the streams of water, yield fruit in due season, uh, my leaf wouldn't, wouldn't wither, and whatever I do prosper. And I'm like, well, that's what I want to be. I mean, come on. If that's what the Bible says that I need to do, it says I need to delight myself in the law of God and meditate on it. Yeah. You know the passage. And it says I need to not walk in the counsel of God and not do these things. So I'm like, okay, I need to watch what comes into my mind. And what I need to do is I need to delight myself in God's word each day. So as a 12-year-old kid, by the spirit of God and the grace of God, I began to get in the word of God each day. I remember staggering over to my desk, almost falling asleep and opening up my Bible and that commitment, I must be in the Word, I must be in the Word. And God used that to grow me. And every day in the Word, from junior high at 12 all the way through high school, my high school year, so I became confused because we're going to this church and, and I'm wondering what is, a, and I'm seeing the hypocrisy. There's affairs going on in our church, nobody's doing anything, and I'm reading my Bible and 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 tr trying to wonder, what is a Christian? So I, I go to the back of my Bible, my concordance, and I look up the word Christian. And it says, well, the, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. I'm like, okay. Then a Christian is a disciple. 
I'm like, okay, well, well, what's a disciple? So I go to the word disciple in the back of my Bible. I look up the word disciple, and it says, if you don't pick up your cross and follow me, you what? Can't be my disciple. I'm like, wait a second. So what is a Christian? It's someone who surrenders their life to God. And I'm like, well, wait a second here. Do my parents realize that? Do my brothers realize that? They said a prayer, but did that save them? And I'm like, they've never surrendered their life. Do they know the truth of this? So I go to my pastor. I'm like, pastors, do you? And they said, that's a works-based salvation. And I go, whoa, well, I don't want to do that. But then they said, you know, but, but uh, salvation is by grace. And I go, I, yeah, I know the Bible says that. And they said, and I said, so, and then they said, you, and I said, so what's the sinner's prayer? The Bible doesn't even talk about the sinner's prayer. You're a 12-year-old kid not knowing all the different theological issues going on. And then they, they told me that, well, wait a second here. Uh, that, that, that's it's us expressing faith. I'm like, okay, but wait a second here. If I have faith and I have belief, aren't I doing something? How does all of this work with grace? And I had no idea because I had no one to teach me. I remember wanting someone to disciple me. No one was around to disciple me. I remember circling words like circumcision and things like that and saying to my youth pastor, what does that mean? What is that? Gentiles. And I had no idea. I was just a young kid hungry to know the truth. And uh, fast forward, so, so then all of a sudden I come to 1 Corinthians 5 where it talks about remove church discipline. And I'm like, these people are having an affair, shouldn't we do this to them? They said, well, that's the most unloving thing you can do. And I thought to myself, well, what is this Bible for anyways? <laughs> and uh, so w- with that, what happened was uh, I, I was in confusion, but I just kept reading my Bible, kept studying it, and, and falling more and more deeply in love with it. I remember going to school, and I had my Jesus shirt and my Bible in my hand when I went to school. I just wanted, and I'd sit at night just trying to dream of, God, how can we reach this campus for Christ? And that's all the work of God uh, uh, with uh, just moving within my life. My, you know, my family, uh, anybody, and, you know, I love my family to death, but uh, it's the uniquest home that you can come from. And uh, with that, I then thought, okay, it's time to go to college. What college do I go? So I was a child. I went, I went to a Christian school, then I went to a secular school, then I went back to a Christian school. My last year in high school, I was a chaplain of my school. And, uh, and I'm thinking, where do I go to university? I knew nothing of John MacArthur. I went to all seven different uh, Christian universities in California. And the last one I go to is master's. And I'm just saying, Lord, can you just show me where I need to go? After I go to each one, I'm like, ah, ah. I go to master's and I go, I don't know what it is about this school, but I just know this is where I need to be. Is that not God at work? I get there. That's right as Faith Works book was written. And I realize that God is the giver of faith. God is the giver of salvation. It's God by grace who illuminates the mind, who sets us free. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound to save a a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm amazing grace. I realized in my college days that God was the one who saved me. I remember in college just, just crying in my class, in, in, my, in my dorm room as I listened to Steve Green's hymns, which are still a classic. I mean, come on, everyone listens to Steve Green's hymns. Josh? <laughs> I, come on. But I remember the hymn going, And Can It Be? that I should gain an interest in the Savior's love. Died he for me. And then it ends by going, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? And it became so personal to me. I realized my God died for me, died for my sin. And, and, I, just, and I just cried there, realizing amazing love. How could he love me, a sinner? How? How? And that became so sweetened in my own heart as I began to understand a a man-centered gospel from a God-exalting gospel. And uh, that became, so when I was at the college, I was a biblical counseling major, and and I just began to grow like a weed, and I kept, and they practiced church discipline, and I'm like, I knew the Bible said that. (laughs) 
I went back to those pastors. I said, you know what? This is what the Bible says. And that didn't go over very well. But, uh, but I, I mean, I could, it was just an affirming thing where I realized, wait, the Bible is sufficient. The Bible has the authority. It speaks and it is alive and to be exercised in our life today. I then went through uh, the master's university when I was a sophomore. I went on a mission trip. I thought, well, let me go on a mission trip. So I tried all these different mission places, and, and uh, I, we, we went in this tent. I'm like, Utah, ah, that's not very cool. And I go, okay, UK, that's like a vacation. We're not going there. And then they came to Africa. I'm like, well, that's a mission trip. Come on, right? <laughs> so I, I come in, and I'm like, okay, let's go to Uganda. We went to Kenya for a month, Uganda. When I got there, and again, no desire, I wanted to go back and help the American church know the truth. And uh, I go to uh, Kenya and Uganda, and I'm like, oh my goodness. There is a whole world of people that long to be taught God's word, but have no one to teach them. And it got deeply embedded. I remember being impacted by that and impacted by the fact that there was physical problems in the world, people living in pain. There was a kid that had epilepsy, and uh, he had such bad epileptic seizures that his whole face had been mangled because he would, the the seizures would get worse and worse, and he'd hit his head on buildings and and on rocks that are on the ground. And there was another kid with water in the brain, hyphosyphilis. And you literally see this person's head go like this. And you're like, oh my, like, could this be, and, and I just remember being overwhelmed. I came back from that trip, and I went to Dodger Stadium because everybody who was cool goes as a Dodger fan, right? I, okay, yeah. So uh, I didn't say Laker fan. I said Dodger fan. So uh, with that, I remember going there singing God Bless America and realizing, oh, my goodness, God has blessed what? America. And uh, I then later on finished, uh, high, finished university, uh, went to seminary. I met this incredible woman. She was playing the piano, and the Shekinah glory came down from heaven. <laughs> and, uh, and I ended up marrying her. There she is, Danielle Hurley. And, and I'll, uh, I'll bring her next time because she's actually the coolest person. But I uh, um, ended up getting married to her. And, uh, and then needed to provide. And then I, I went into seminary. So I went to seminary. Someone came to me. I, I, I hated seminary, okay? I just didn't like it, uh, partly because it made me study. <laughs> so I, I didn't go to school to study. I went to play. And I realized that in seminary, you're, if you're called, you better sit your bottom in the chair. And so that's what I was taught. And I told Josh before he went to seminary, dude, put your hand to the plow. Don't look back. And when you get there, you come ready to work. If you're not ready to work, you're not ready to go, but it's worth it. Sit it in a chair and do it. Uh, Do you remember me saying that to you, Josh? Come on. Uh, So with that, uh, I went back to seminary and I said, I'm going to do it. I went a semester, dropped out a semester, then went back and said, I don't care what it takes. I'm going to get through this. And uh, needed to pay for my wife to eat. (laughs) So I started uh, working in a job called Beverly Hills Teddy Bear Company. Come on, if you're going to be a pastor, work for a teddy bear company, right? But what we did was we did custom stuffed animals. So what I could do is I could take any thing and turn it into a stuffed animal. So I could take a picture of Josh and turn him into a stuffed animal. (laughs) If you could buy a thousand pieces, I can do it. So we would do things like the Grinch that stole Christmas. We would do licensed characters, uh, the Grinch Stole Christmas. We would do things like Hulk and Lion King, all of these different things. But I would do the promotional side of things. And uh, and after year one, you know, and and, and with that, I'm just learning what it is to walk by faith. And I'm realizing I need to be faithful today and trust God for tomorrow. Here is God's word. Let me just be faithful and trust God to care for tomorrow. So I'm just making calls. For one year, I'm making calls. I I go to seminary, come to work, go back to seminary, and and that's kind of how life was. And I'm making call after call after call, and and all of a sudden, I get my first order. I remember it very vividly. It was a, uh, a, a Green Bay Packer stuffed animal, all right? And, uh, and, and then 
I start figuring out what this job is and, and how to do this thing. I go to Asia, I come back, so we would bring them in from Asia, Hong Kong. Uh, I'd fly into Hong Kong, go into uh, Shenzhen and, and those types of things, work with the, the factories there to make the toys. So I start figuring out after year three, I'm starting to get an order a week of custom stuffed animals. Like, that's crazy. How in the world are you getting an order a week? Like one of the orders I got were uh, 25,000 super duper pooper bears. No lie. It was a bear that danced and said, I'm a super duper pooper. I go potty with the, I won't go anywhere. But, uh, and it just danced. And uh, 25,000 of these things. I'm like, this is crazy. You can look it up online. It's probably there. But uh, you could probably do something more edifying. Like, <laughs> But uh, with that, the Lord just kept blessing this thing. And so we started hiring people to just call to find out these promotional companies use stuffed animals. If they did, we'd put them on hold. I'd get on the phone. So then I'd get on the phone and, and I'd say, hey, you know, da, 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 da. And uh, well, one person said, I need a duck. Well, I had just been to Asia. I'd just seen this incredibly beautiful duck on the shelf uh, there, and I grabbed it, because I liked it, I had small kids at the time, and, and so I grabbed this duck, I bring it with me uh, back from Asia. Well, they needed a duck. I'm like, well, I have a duck right here. Now, this company was from, you know, the south, and, you know, they used the same people every time, and, uh, and that's just how they work. Well, this company just, they had asked the company they normally use for a duck, they didn't provide this duck, and uh, I just happened in that two-month window to call them and say, hey, I need a duck. So I go and, and I air, air it over, a duck over to them. I say, hey, we want 2,000 pieces. We love this duck. I'm like, no problem. You want them aired out? Yeah, we want a bandana on it. No problem. Let me get that duck to you. So I go and I send them 2,000. They turn around and say, Shannon, we need 50,000 and we need them aired in. I'm like, what in the world? Who airs 50,000 pieces in? So we do that, we get them 50,000 pieces. Well, they turn around and they, and, and they launch a commercial. That commercial was called Aflac. <laughs> so I'm watching this commercial, I'm going, you know, watching the commercial, this duck goes, Aflac, 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 you know. And I'm like, well, I got to have that dad chip. So I get that dad chip, I put it into this duck so that when you press the duck, it goes, Aflac, Aflac, Aflac. And, and when I do that, they order 200,000 pieces. And 50,000 pieces a month for the every month after that. And I'm like, oh my goodness, what in the world is going on? So I'm in seminary producing ducks all over the country. And, uh, and I, I remember when I went into seminary thinking to myself, well, wait, what does it mean to be a Christian businessman. And the second question I had is, why in the world are you blessing this whole toy thing? And so with that, I then, um, I knew that God didn't call me to sell toys. I, was, I always wanted to preach. I wanted the truth of God to be made known. And so with that, I finished seminary. Upon finishing seminary, I reached back to friends in Uganda when I get to these friends and call these friends in Uganda, I had met, known a guy that was uh, from Kenya. He moved to Uganda to start a ministry. I fly out there to Uganda. I get out there and I'm going, oh my goodness, what am I doing in this country? At that time, you get there, there's lizards crawling up the walls, there's things flying in the air. I'm under a mosquito net and I'm thinking, what, what am I doing here? Uh, later on in that trip, I go up to the country and I uh, up country and I do, there's an evangelistic effort and they they want to do seminars to be trained in some things. So I pick one seminar on dating because every young person likes teaching on dating. And then there's a second seminar that they have that's left over on widows. So I choose. Well, I'll do that and 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 it happened to be the next day. So I go and I I begin to teach on widows and I'm like I don't have know what. I don't have anything to say to you on widows. All I know is what the Bible has to say. Let me teach you about it. Well, I ended up teaching for two hours because people just had question after question. Well, the person that in the next seminar said, Shannon, will you teach ours because we want to know what the Bible has to say. I teach the next one. Well, they ended up doing two hours of question and answer after the teaching. 
And then I, the, I end up teaching all of the seminars all week because they just wanted to hear what the Bible had to say. And I'm thinking, I've never seen people so hungry for truth. And this is getting embedded in my heart. Well, and, and so then at the end of this trip, some of these Anglican bishops are coming saying, hey, can you come and train our pastors? I'm like, oh, goodness gracious. And, uh, and I remember... I remember going and getting on the plane at the end of that trip, looking out across Uganda's you know, airport, thinking, am I really willing to surrender my life to serve in Uganda? I sat down in, my pla- in the plane, having just read through Hebrews 11, and I even asked myself a more fundamental question. Do I really believe this to be the truth? Because I knew that there was only one thing that was going to cause me to move my family across the world. And it was the fact that I believe this to be true. And people, and I believe that people need it. At that moment, I said to my own heart, I know it's true. And when you read it, Hebrews 11, I encourage you to go home and read it. And realize that in the Hebrews 11, we're all living for a future kingdom that's not our own. We're all living in light of the promises of God. And, and that's what drives us. We're living for the unknown, not the known. Because of promises in God's word. And I'm like, I know it's true and I'm willing to go. So at that point, then I'm, you know, I get home. I try and communicate to my wife. And she has her own story. Uh, we'll let her share that at another time. But I realized at that point that, uh, wait a second here, I think God has blessed this whole Aflac thing for the purposes of Uganda. So I started SOS Ministries, and you've got a brochure on SOS Ministries there. I started this ministry. Uh, I've been there 17 years. I started mainly so I can give. And I'm like, I don't want anybody to give to anything that I'm not surrendered to. So I began, to, I spent four more years in the toy business as I prepared to leave, move my family. So I had eight years in the toy business. And, you know, we did all kinds of crazy things. And God just blessed it immensely. And, uh, and you know, basically what, what I realized is, wait a second here. If God did this for the toy business, well, let me give crazy. So I began to give in crazy ways. You know, and I realized that, wait a second here, if I, you know, I get a call from Hallmark Canada, and I did a lot with Hallmark Canada, they said, Shannon, can you do this product for us? I said, well, you do me a favor, you give me a purchase order today, and I'll make it happen. So I call my wife and I say, honey, I need to go to Asia tonight. But she was all in because she knew that whatever money we made, we could use it to advance kingdom purposes. So, so I'd fly to Asia that night. I knew we could make 10,000 bucks on it. And so with that, you can then give. And it became so exciting to be in the business world because it wasn't money in and of itself. It was money for kingdom purposes. And it, it just motivated us to do whatever we could do for kingdom. And it became exciting and it became exhilarating. And I think it answered literally the question that was in my mind. What does it mean to be a godly businessman? And, I, and you're up in these these uh, business lounges, and these guys are all depressed, alone, because of the fact that they've been living for the temporal instead of the eternal. And all of a sudden, I'm like excited about life and excited about working because I get to live for kingdom and for a master. Well, that became an exhilarating thing, and uh, and and and. With that, then, I then, in 2006, moved my family to Uganda, Africa. My little youngest boy, who's this guy here, uh, he was uh, the, the one to my right there. Uh, he um, was three months old. Uh, my son that's to my left there was three years old, and my daughter, who's not in there, was uh, six years old. The craziest and probably the most illogical thing you could possibly do is move your family to Africa knowing very little in a time when the medical system is a joke. And, uh, but we moved our family uh, there, and what we did was we came and, and, uh, and we moved uh, into a place called Makono. 
Well, I, I uh, realized very quickly that the person, so I, I was sending money over to, to establish, get a piece of land, to put some houses up. Well, little did I know that the person that I had partnered with was corrupt. And uh, so I'm sitting in the middle of Africa with my family and working with a corrupt guy. And he said, I'm free to live there as long as I obey his rules. And I realized that God had called me to this country, and I realized that, you know what, it really doesn't matter. God has me here. I'm going to be faithful today and trust God for. And let me just tell you guys, when you get through trials, you get through different challenges, be faithful to God and his word today and trust God for tomorrow. And literally, I'm like, I'm going to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added to me. And this is where the Bible comes alive. And so I began to then just dedicate myself. I'm going to walk in righteousness just like the God of, of Joseph is my God. And so if I'm in a pit, no problem. He'll, he'll lead me out of it. And so I began to just be faithful. And I remember getting angry with this guy because he controlled the water to our property. He had a reserve tank. I didn't. Well, he turned the water off so that I would have no water and I would hate life and I would just pick up and go and then leave everything to him. And uh, as a result of that, I, I knew this. And so I get down and I said, can you please turn the water on so we can have showers? And, uh, and I remember getting angry with him. And, I, and then I go back to my desk to sit down with the Lord. And I realize, wait a second here. The Bible calls me to love my and do good to those and to pray. So I'd make cookies. I had my wife make the cookies. I didn't want him to eat my cookies. That would have been bad, but... Uh, and then I'd send a note just apologizing because I realized that I'm going to walk in obedience and do, put God's word to action. We ended up leaving there and moving into a small little village. Let me just say one thing. Uh, in 2018, that, by the, that guy was married to a German. That marriage broke up because he was having an affairs with all different individuals. The German lady left. When she left... She went looking, to, and this is 2018, she went looking for someone that can be a godly example to her son, and she came and found me. And that's just God's grace, right? Usually stories don't end with a romantic ending, but that's just a story of what God would do. And I got to be a mentor to that boy for several months during COVID time before he went to Germany. Uh, I decided at that point, you know, it was a wonderful thing. Remember, usually when God uses somebody, he first sends them to the wilderness, right? Moses, David, and many of God's servants. And so those three years were like the wilderness, and I was going to love God's truth, hold dearly to it, and just be faithful another day as we then planned. So we planned our ministry out as to what we wanted to do. I established a board in Uganda, uh, and we then launched our ministry. I decided to move to a small little village called Kubamitwe. Everybody say Kubamitwe. Kubamitwe. There it is right there. It literally means hit the head. And the reason, you know, and the way I got there is I was working at that point with the, the Anglican church, and uh, I was working with Luero Diocese, so I thought, let me just move into Luero area, establish our ministry. I went to some place, I said, can I have 50 acres? And they said, Here, here's 100 acres, and they were really cheap. And I thought, well, it's so cheap, I need to go a second time. So I go, well, I moved to this village called Kubamitwe. In the Buganda kingdom, there's seven places that did executions. And they were all called Kubamitwe because it means hit the head, pop. So it was cheap, but there was a reason, you know. Well, I didn't know that, but our community was as pagan as pagan gets. Zero people married. And again, know that the marriage process is, involves money and things like zero people married. Every, drunkards all over the place. Everybody's doing what is right in their own and remember this, everybody doing what's right in their own eyes. We need to remember that because where is America going? Ultimately, people are simply given over to the lusts and the passions of their flesh to indulge in anything they want. And that is what 
has gone on in Africa. That's what was going on in my village. Everybody just given over to whatever. Everybody getting in fights and beating each other. No love, no trust, no nothing. The Bible says in the last days that people will be lovers of self, right? Lovers of pleasure, that the love, love for others will grow cold. Why? Because that's the fruit of sin. That's the fruit of being given over to your lusts and pleasures. And our country, America, is the greatest country in the world because we've been built on God's truth. Our law and our government and our constitution all has truth embedded in it. And as a result of that, we have been living in the shade of Christianity for the last 200 years. Can we say amen? amen. And let me apply this in this way. I come into this village where everybody, and, and let me give, before I do that, let me give some context. In the African home throughout most of Africa, now northern Africa is all Muslim, it looks different. I'm from uh, East Africa downward is very similar almost anywhere you go. The, Af the, the man and the woman, they don't get married. As a result of not getting married, there's no covenant for life. And so with that, he has his money, she has her money. The way they come together is they're drinking in the bar or they're out gambling and one thing leads to another, she gets pregnant. Well, then she comes into his home, but there's no covenant, no commitment. So what happens? And, and again, you don't have, there's no abortion. Abortions are illegal. You don't have money, so there's, no, uh, there's nothing to prevent children from being born, conceived. And so as a result of that, children are being produced everywhere. Well, the problem is they don't marry. So they have these kids, who do they belong to? Well, according to the, the, the culture, they belong to the man. Come on. And man, we do such a great job taking care of kids, right? And, uh, but again, so the woman never grows really attached. And, that, and, and he's not, he, she's there to clean, to cook, and to just be slave labor in that home. He comes home, the kids don't like their dad. A lot of them drink. So he comes home and he beats the kids and it's all male dominance. He beats the wife. If she's not cleaning and cooking, whack, whack. That is every African home almost. Whether they're a pastor or because it's part of the society. Because the society is doing what's right in their own So as a result of that, what we did was, you know, so the dad comes home. He eats alone. The food is brought to him. There's no relationship with those children. There's no relationship at any level. And so that is the average home. So what happens is, the, how long does that relationship last? Not very long. Some of them have great endurance, but usually what happens is another woman gets brought in and that pushes her out of the home. So what happens to those children? Usually, by 13 years old, they're on their own anyways. And with that, that's why often 13-year-olds are having children, especially when they're not in school, because there's no school, so they're not growing up with food regularly in their home. They're, the whole establishment of the society is absolutely broken. Now we wonder why Africa is what Africa is. So with that, another person comes in. Usually the children get dropped off at the grandparents' house. If you're a grandparent, you can say, well, there's not something so bad. Well, yeah, they're nice when they come and they go what? Go home, right? But if they're running around, you're not wanting to use all your energy to chase kids. And, that, and that's what happens. The biggest problem in Africa are children abandoned everywhere. And that was what our community looked like. So I came into this community and said, how can we reach this community for Christ? How can we reach it for Christ? And what I began to do is we put together, a, first, we had three strategies. One, let's put together a primary school so that kids can be discipled. They're coming from all these crazy home life, but so there was no education in our community. There was, so p kids were growing up. The, the official language is English. So if you come to Uganda, you can, learn, you, you can speak English with all those who are educated. No one in our community had any English speaking because none of them were educated. So we started a school. Today we have a school of 600 children up through, say, eighth grade. Every year we add a level, add a level. 
Uh, we provide breakfast, we provide lunch, we provide uniforms, we provide everything. There's a few places you can even get sponsorship for kids, just like Compassion, uh, through our website. So uh, with that, we have, so you can imagine our communities, we have a target community of, say, 6,000. We have today, we're educating 10% of our community right in our school. Helping them two days a week, they've got chapel, and we're just pumping Christ into these kids. This is our message to our community. There is a king, and his way is the best. Everybody, there is a king, and his way is the best. There is a king, and his way is the best. When we look at the Great Commission, the Great Commission is all authority has been given to me. I'm the king. Now go and make followers of me. God stands over the world saying, follow me, follow me for your good. You're going to preach in Romans 7 here in a, in a couple weeks. And the, the end conclusion is the, that the law of God is holy, righteous, and good. This is the message that has to go out. That our God is good, his way is the best. So we have dominated our society with that truth. And we began to say, well, you got to first deal with your sin problem. And there's only one that can set you free from your sin problem. And that his name is what? Jesus. Jesus Christ. So that message began to just permeate into our society. Discipleship everywhere through our local church. So we had this primary school where we're discipling these kids, helping them grow up in that message. We then do activities. Those activities have now run into us reaching out to the disabled. We do activities and we reach out to the disabled. We work as an arm of Johnny and Friends Ministry here to reach the disabled out there. And I'm telling you, it is the most unbelievable thing to be in a room like this with all these disabled people, cerebral palsy, all of these people suffering. Moms carrying these big kids in and then giving them a mobility device and loving on them in the name of Christ. It's incredible. The third thing that we began to do is we have people that just have medical problems. You know, you can imagine, what do you do? And again, just to give you insight into the rest of it, what do you do when you're nine months pregnant, ready to give birth, and you have no vehicle to get to the hospital that's an hour away? What do you do? <laughs> you, you walk, you're going to have a baby halfway, you know, so... Well, that's the problem. So people would run to us. We would then take them to the hospital. We've had babies born in cars. We've had twins be born blue and us rushing them to the hospital. All of these different amazing, crazy situations. We had one guy who had a, a uh, leg that they didn't go to the doctor. So literally, he had his leg was eaten away beyond the nerves, and he had maggots inside of his leg because they have no cash to go get medical assistance. So these things come to us, and we're able to then care for them. Well, we just started this last year a medical center so that we can help our people. When they get malaria, they get all these things, they just come right to our medical center to love on them. These ministries we all began to do within our society. As a result today, by the grace of God, we've literally seen a transformation of a whole entire society. Uh, on... On Sunday morning, we have 550 kids, I mean, 550 people in our church growing and loving Christ and, and being discipled in the Lord. It's been unbelievable to see. In addition to that, we, our first mission was to reach our community. Our second mission has been to strengthen churches throughout Uganda because we believe with all our heart the hope of the world is the church, a true church teaching truth throughout the country. But we realize that there are not training centers that do this, so we need to establish that. But first thing we need to do is establish a relationship. We establish a relationship with the Baptist Union of Uganda. We'd go around doing conferences. Bruce Blakey has been on two conferences. Give it up for Bruce. He calls it a young man's trip. And, uh, but we, we did send him through the ringer. So come on, you can clap a second time for Bruce. He'd live in schools with us and just preach Christ to, to these pastors. But we've done conferences, leadership trainings, all of these types of things. And uh, as a result of that, um, we've established this relationship with the Baptist Union of Uganda, 1,500 churches, Baptist Convention of South Sudan, 220 uh, churches. And with that, then they now having, have us train their pastors. So there's nine areas in Uganda, six in South Sudan. They, from each one of those areas, we take five men. 
just in February had 60 men come to do a certificate course. In that certificate course, what we do is we basically take them through the gospel and through Christian living. We want everyone to know there is a king and his way is the... And we want them to get out of land. So these pastors, the first year we take them in, we're taking them. I want them to experience the way I experienced the gospel in college. I want them crying over their own sin in all of God for the saving work that he's done. And I would just say to you, love, study the word, study the gospel till it's become so personalized that it drives you to recognize he saved me. It, until it becomes personalized. Well, that's what we take our guys through the first six months. We take them in for six months, away from their families, but they come two months, go back, cut two months, come back, two months, go back. And that's our certificate thing. We want to see who's serious. We want to see who's, who's and, and know these students academically in all these other ways. So we bring them in, and we just train them up. I, we take the first 40 guys in. Well, we realize 13 of them are living in immoral relationships with the women. And we realize how many, and they're all like heads on the table recognizing I am such a sinful person, should I continue in this program? And that's a society, right? So we begin to, and, and, and we begin to, many of these guys get saved through the process. And then we begin to show them a Pilgrim's Progress worldview. Everyone has to read Pilgrim's Progress. That's the worldview we should have. There's a king on his throne, and we're on our way to the celestial city. Do not get off the road. Stay right on it. Our greatest cry is, Lord, keep me on your way. And the loving thing we do is we go with people out of God's way and we love them on the God's way so they can experience the love that God desires to give them. Amen? And so with that, uh, we're then helping these pastors follow the king in the certificate level. We then vet them from there and then we encourage them we then invite them to the degree level. We have not started our degree program. Right now we have houses going up all for these families to come. We want the pastor to come. When we see the, the pastor is solid, we then invite him to come with his family. Because what we want to do is see these families following the king. We want to correct the marriage problem. Correct the parenting problem. And see these families functioning according to God's design. And so we're going to bring the whole family in, and as we do this degree program, try and get that family following the king so that when they leave, they can go back to their communities and help their communities, what? Follow the? And that's how we're going to see Uganda impacted. That's how we're going to see South Sudan impact when Christ is reigning in the hearts of these people. And so that's our strategy, our strategy in the future. When, so we're getting ready, 2024 to launch our degree program. We are so over our heads. One thing I like about Compass Bible, we're just, this place is just making it happen and we figure out the details later. Well, we, that's how we are in Uganda. And, and honestly, God has met us every single step of the way. Uh, we have capital programs going. We, we've got all kinds of things going. And, and honestly, we're calling on the American church to help us God is making his name known in Africa. And, and there's very, to get to where we've gotten 17 years is an absolute miracle. We have to fund this thing. The end of the year, we're probably about $20,000 a month in the hole. And so I'm like, well, and, and there was just love gifts that have been given to that sustain us. Well, this church said, hey, we're going to help out. We're on the team. We're going to participate. And so we can praise God for Compass Bible Church. And, uh, and so I just, if, if God would put on your heart to join our team, please, through our website, I, there's even a, a, uh, a church impact flyer that we've given. You can hit a QR code there and go right to our website. We need monthly givers so that we can fill this gap. Because the problem is, is anyhow, I can't complain because God has cared for us every step of the way. And so with that, I continue to trust God to provide. If the Lord put it on your heart to help us, we would praise God for that. Guys, let us live radical for the king. And, uh, and let me just say that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. By the way, I work with a missionary team. I have four missionaries. We have 12 senior staff, Ugandan men. We have 170 employees today in our village, all having to be housed, all having to do this. We're going to invite all of you guys to come to Uganda. 
Are you guys ready? Come on. Come on. It's not an old, it's not a young man's trip. It's an old man's trip. Uh, we, we would invite you to come just to see what God's doing. Let me say, let me end by, by saying this. I really believe, remember 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the foolish things of the world will shame the what? Could it be that in the last age of church history, God could work in Africa, who are supposed to be the uneducated community, raise up his church there to shame the Western world who think they know better without God? I think that's what he's doing. I also think he wants dancing in heaven, so he wants, you know, Africans to get saved. <laughs> you guys are doing an incredible job here. And one thing I've learned through the years is that it's not just what we do, but it's who we encourage along the way. God is using you and your families. God is using you. Just keep being on fire, Focus like a razor. You know, no man entangles himself with the affairs of everyday life so he can please the one who's enlisted him. Live for our master. Guys, there is a king. His way is the best. And let us bend the knee to him and serve him with diligence and faithfulness. Trusting God for today. Wait, trusting God today for what he'll do tomorrow. And uh, let me just pray for all of you and then pass it over to, to Bruce. Father, we love you. And Lord, who would have thought that in your grace and your kindness, you would allow me the privilege to be here at Compass Bible Church. Father, thank you for this awesome ministry. Thank you for the zeal and the passion of, uh, of this elder team. Father, empower them and strengthen them. Keep the devil and all that he would want to do to distract this ministry away and help this team to continue to serve you with faithfulness and fervency. Father, and we pray that the church people here would rally behind the ministry, rally behind the men driving this thing, and that your name would be made great. That Huntington Beach and Long Beach in the days to come would know that there's a king and that the people would stop doing what's right in their own eyes and know the joy of resting in their father's hands. Father, help us in Uganda. Provide as you would see fit for the glory, praise, and honor of your name we pray. Amen. Stand right here. Yeah, so it's pretty exciting what the Lord's doing in, in Uganda, and it is a young man's trip. <laughs> I've done it twice as an old man, and uh, it's uh, thankful to still be alive. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, it, it was some of the things he said about the family situation over there. So we did a conference in another region of the, of the country, and I, I'm teaching at one time, and it's a question and answer time. And the question was, what's a man supposed to do when his, when his wife isn't pleasing him? And I said, a husband's supposed to love his wife no matter what she's doing. And a, a riot broke out in the room. And uh, it was getting out of control fast. And so before they could drag me out of town and stone me, <laughs> uh, I had to convince them, no, that, I didn't make that up. Let me show you, the Bible says that. That husbands are supposed to love their wives. So, yeah, what they're doing there, I mean, you, it's, it's, it's a tough situation, but they do want to know what the Bible says, right? Well, and, and pray for us. Yeah. Pray for us. Pray for us. Pray that we would love the Lord with all our hearts, just even as missionaries, and that we would love the Lord with all our hearts, and that, and that the overflow would just be God's blessing and kindness. Yeah, so this class, we usually end with uh, any, any questions. So does anybody have any, any questions about Uganda or, or what's the fastest way to get there? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> any, any questions? Yes, sir. Yep. Right. Not that explicitly, but how, how does he learn how to like integrate in, into that? Yeah. 
Well, time helps. The, the Ugandan culture is very gracious. Uh, it's part of the kickback nature of things. It's not like France is a difficult culture. You have to literally watch your, you know, dot your, your I's and cross your T's there. Uganda is a gracious community. When you love them, that's the best way just to integrate inside. I think, honestly, we relied on the Word of God to guide us and to direct us, and just talked to the people. Let them be our teachers. And that's how we did it. 17 years later, they, they think that I'm, you know, a, a Ugandan myself. And part of it, honestly, is even time, slowing ourselves down at their pace and just kind of floating with the, the culture. Um, so it was a lot of just relationship. As you build relationship, you're learning. And not only that, but in the Luganda, you learn a lot. Just through translation, you realize, you know, how things function just even through language. And so all of my kids are, are fluent in Luganda. And, uh, you know, it, it, the, the, yeah. Huge. I mean, what I would say is that anything imported is more expensive. Anything local is cheap. And so when it comes to salaries, it goes very far. I mean, if I, I couldn't pay for 170 people to be employed in this country. Uh, over there, the, the problem is our economy, you know, the economies, are, we're watching those all the time. And, uh, and I need to give more money to certain individuals there. But everything's got, you know, you do what you have. So it goes very far. I built, like the church building we built, as a 1,200-seater with 400 people that can go outside on the right and the left of the place so we can do conferences. You guys, as a church, participated in this. We did it for basically doing it for, you know, $900,000. And so uh, no restrictions regarding government. They don't take any of that, you know, so it's awesome. Yeah, so just the comparison, 900000 for that building. We're spending $4 million just to renovate. renovate a warehouse. So it goes very far that way. How much does it cost like, to feed a child, a pastor, and his family like, monthly for food? And so we're looking at $300 a month to, to subsidize. So the problem is these pastors don't have money. They have barely money to get there, let alone to pay for an education. So we're looking at $300 a month to, to per family because we'll give them some money so that they can begin to... Uh, um, care for themselves and, and in every regard. And so that's what we're looking at right now. A classroom, a, a, a housing block is costs $50,000 to do three family housing units. The beauty is, is we'll have those forever and ministry will continue. So those are two cap, that's a capital thing that we're working on even now. There's a question over here. What I would say is that it, we feel very safe there today. Africa is an interesting, I mean, you have the Rwanda, uh, you know, what are they, genocide, where it, it's flared up like this, angers went, and before you know it, you've got millions of people dead. Uh, I mean, anything can flare up. You do have the, we uphold the Muslim community to the north of us. South Sudan is that is the bridge between them. Uh, there's always, you know, Idi Amin historically in our country tried to make Uganda a Muslim country. All of that's a f threat. However, today, and that's the day we live in, we want to push back all of that evil with raising the church up. And uh, look, every, I mean, we've had people killed down our road. They do mob justice and kill somebody. And so, uh, I mean, everything's a threat but when you love a community, they protect you. And so we, we trust the Lord. It, life is scary uh, on that side in certain regards. But at the same time, we, we just keep resting in the Lord. Uh, over here. Yes. Yes, we do. Yeah, what do we do? Well, we have a very safe, uh, you know, campus. And, uh, and we have beautiful housing for short-term teams to come uh, because we don't want you to suffer while you're there. We make it very comfortable. Uh, we will put someone like Josh in a tent, but the rest of you <laughs> will uh, be in a nice, nice place. But um, 
Yeah, so we provide nice place to, to stay. You actually eat very well when you're there, but we will send you like in, in our church people's homes for a, a meal so that you can enjoy just what life is as a church person in, in Uganda. Uh, there's so much to do. And never on a mission trip to Uganda worry about what you're going to do. We'll find out what your gifting is and we'll utilize you. You just get exposed. And watch what God does in your heart. You're going to get there and say, this is what we've done for our community. What are you doing for yours? And what do we need to do together to, to love the Lord and advance his name throughout this universe? And, uh, and so, but you, we have a primary school. We've got a local church. We've got a health center. We've got uh, Baptist groups that we work with. There's so much to do. And we'll, uh, we'll work with your leadership to figure out what is the best thing. You could do evangelism in all the schools nearby. And, uh, and so we just send you to the schools. You do evangelism. And uh, so there's a ton to be done, and we want your help. We want every year to come with a team from uh, Compass Bible. Yeah, our church in Texas sent a team out there, maybe a dozen people or so, and uh, they were busy the whole time they were there. And you didn't have the medical center then, but you were providing some medical assistance, assistance at yeah. the time, and people would line up. And the job, one of the ministries our people did was to give the gospel to everybody that's standing in line, mm. waiting for the medical assistance. So there's, there's plenty of opportunity uh, to do that. O okay, you only get two, so this is your second one. <laughs> yeah. You know what? <laughs> I... Honestly, one of, one of them, I, I got to go to master's. So my oldest brother is gay, uh, and I'll be with him on Monday. You guys can pray that God will just do a, a gospel impact there. I'll be with him tomorrow uh, for dinner. My youngest brother, he'll be there too for dinner. Uh, he's an atheist. And then I have a twin brother. I'm far better looking of the two, but uh, <laughs> I have a twin brother who is, uh, he's just a churchgoer. I don't know whether... It, the Lord has opened his mind. I'll be with him another time. I'm hoping to just continue to challenge him. And then I have one other brother that's 10 years younger than me who's actually leading a charge against abortion. And uh, he, there's people following him. He, he's crazy. Like, he, you think I'm crazy. I mean, he's, he's telling Nancy Pelosi what's up. So uh, <laughs> calling her to repentance. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's pretty radical what he's doing. Some people follow him, and A.J. Hurley is his, his name, but he's over the top for me. Uh, so, but, but, you know, God's at work. I, I was just with my parents. Look, I mean, pray. As you pray for me, pray for my family. I'd love to see God open their hearts. It's probably the biggest burden I've ever had since I was a kid. Uh, my mom is, is a hoarder, so you can imagine the home that I grew up in. My mom's 100% Sicilian-Italian. And, and you knew it, <laughs> you know, so that's why I use my hands when I talk, so. So, so he, he used a, a phrase, uh, let's, let's get your take on this, radical Christian. Mm. Is there any other kind? You, you, you're going to hear the sermon later on. You're either a slave of sin or a slave of righteousness. righteousness. You're one or the other. And so with that, I would just say that, uh, and, and part of that, obviously, as we grow, we understand what it is to put off and to put on. But uh, when God changes you, he changes you. And so, um, you know, it, yeah, no, the, the, you know, the Hebrews 11 is not about super Christians. If you look at 1029, he's telling us who we all are. We're all been people of faith. And as a result of this is how we live in our own spheres of influence. But we do have the, the, a certain world that's pushing against that and creating this other category. But we need to know whether we're either born again or we're not, you know, so... Yeah, going from death to life, that sounds pretty radical. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, one more question back, back here. Yeah, you. Yes. Awesome. I thought that you looked radiant that way. No, it's good. <laughs> yeah. 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 But also, I could answer that question. White Savior, first of all, that's, that's secular propaganda. Right. 
that's from the devil, to be honest with you. The, the, what I would say to you is this. God, and again, let's look at it from God's perspective. God, in his perspective, made certain countries that don't have resources, certain countries that do. Why? So the church can be the church. We can lean on each other, all playing our parts to make an impact. When I was a businessman, I gave money, but I didn't give it wisely. I gave it to a man in an unwise way, and I got taken advantage of. Living in Africa, I think that what I would advise anybody, give to missionaries on the ground that they can give to the people. Giving directly, they've, they've not dealt with that kind of money. They have no structure for how to disciple. They've got, it has to be through the church. It has to be through in my mind, missionaries on the ground who can discern. You get yourself involved in the need and you go after the need and you give all this and then you get sucked into the system of trying to help, but then you're not working with the right people to help. If you want to help, let those guys you know come through and let me understand them so that we can see how we can help. We want the church to advance, but God, we, there are missionaries on the ground to help. It's not white savior anything. At the end of the day, it's, but you need missionaries that are going to live for Christ, who are going to model godliness and are the right missionaries. But uh, I would, that would be a high encouragement I would give you from my own personal experience. Yeah. Yeah. I would love you come, and I would love to share with you. We obviously have a certificate program. Uh, we all, many evangelical works, they'll, because we have the facilities, they come and they do their work there. I can push them into different programs that are going on. We'll do a national youth conference. Let's help these kids know Christ. Uh, when Mazungus get in, we are called a Mazungu. Uh, when a Mazungu gets in directly, I'm telling you, there's fighting going on behind the scenes, a jockeying, because they all want the opportunities that come. Get the protection of other missionaries who can wisely exercise that on your behalf so that you don't get into something that's over your head. And Shannon has put together a book that you've used over there called Quest for Truth. Yes. The Quest for Truth, which is like partners on steroids. <laughs> and you think it's hard work going through partners here. You think of people in Uganda going through this material that he's produced. And I, I and wanted everybody to know the gospel. I didn't. Yeah. I wanted to, so I wrote a book that, that literally takes people's hands and walks them through the gospel because that's what I wanted when I was a kid. So I wrote this book called Quest for Truth. One of these days I'll bring it and just give them away or something. But it's a discipleship tool to help somebody really understand the gospel fully. I have one of those books, and you can borrow it from me for $50 a week. <laughs> All the money goes to Uganda. Uh, come on. Uh -huh. <laughs> no. But when I was there one time, I did a Q&A with some of his workers out under a tree, and they asked me that very question. If God is fair, how come some people have so much like you, Mr. Mizugu, and, and others like us don't have anything? And I started off by saying, well, you know, having everything isn't everything you think it is because you got to insure it, you got to protect it, you got to, you know, maintain it. And they said, we don't care. We'll, we'll do all of that. We, <laughs> we, we just want to have it. So I had to th come up with a different approach. And I said, well, remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Rich man had everything more than everything, and, and Lazarus is eaten out of his trash can at the end of the driveway. And, but in the end, Lazarus goes to heaven and the rich man goes to hell. Mm -hmm. So I said, in the end, who had it better? And they go, well, Lazarus did. And I said, just make sure you wind up where Lazarus is. <laughs> that's, that's the bottom line, yeah. Well, and, and right. again, it, it is a rich treasure that the Lord has given us as Americans. It is an incredible treasure, and uh, it may not be there forever. And uh, in the end of the day, there is human responsibility to do that. And, and, and you, uh, the Uganda is an incredible way to invest in kingdom purpose. There are people suffering there. We're, like, worried about our wants here. We're needs-based there. And, and that's why I would even say, please, if there's any way you people can help in any way, we would greatly, greatly appreciate it. Uh, I run a ministry over there, 
and I got to run or come back here and blah, 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 and then get back there. And, you know, and, you know, as soon as I land, I'm going to do a class on the doctrine of man in my seminary class. I'll preach on Sunday, you know, but we're all, we're just doing what we can and we're dependent on the American church to help out. And so, uh, and any ways that you guys can help us in the mission, we would greatly appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. Now, I'm going to pray in a minute just to give some instructions, though. We need to tear this room down. It's a little different than normal. We need to pick up all the chairs that are on the sides and the bleachers back over here. Those chairs need to go in the Spanish room, second door down. Uh, so if you can help with that, that would be great. The center section can just stay like, like it is. But here's one thing uh, maybe you could, you could do. Every time you see an Aflac commercial, <laughs> pray, Aflac. For, yeah, pray for Shannon and Amen. the ministry there in Uganda. Let, let's pray. Lord, we are thankful to hear the news of what you've done in Shannon's life and what you're doing in Uganda. Uh, Lord, it, it is so exciting to see your hand at work in such a powerful way, transforming uh, people's lives and, and culture and society. And so uh, we're thankful for that. Lord, we pray you'll help us all to be faithful and to be those radical Christians wherever it is you have us. And we thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.